Europe actually is sort of the birthplace of liberty. Over time, if you look at sort of a, uh, you know, the grand sweep of global history, you know, where did you first find the rule of law uh, come in? It was Europe. Where did classical liberalism, not modern liberalism, which is leftism, but classical liberalism, the ideas of Adam Smith and Schum and Locke and people like that, that all appeared in Europe. Things like the Magna Carta, the Golden Bull, the Hanseatic League, the Glorious Revolution. These good ideas and concepts came from Europe, by and large. And actually, many of those ideas were very influential in the American Revolution. Uh, but again, they were born in Europe. And when you look at some of the data about Europe, I think one of the reasons we got good results is because Europe was comprised of many different competing states, especially when you're going back several hundred years in history, because you didn't have big unified countries. Uh, in places like Italy and Germany, you had dozens and dozens of principalities. Uh, those two countries didn't become unified big countries until the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, and, and so in Europe, uh, you know, even today, there are, you know, depending on whether you're just counting Western Europe and how far you're going into Eastern Europe, you have any, anywhere between like 30 and 45 countries that would be European. And again, in the past, it was much, much more. And those different governments were competing with each other. And when governments are forced to compete with each other, I think you get very, very good results. Because especially back then, if you were a serf, and you felt you were being exploited, which you probably were, well, you walk across a border because you had lots of small competing jurisdictions. And not only that, there was also, there, there was a motive on the part of governments, because uh, Europe was just you know, wars, endless wars for centuries. And if you were having endless wars and you were worried about your neighbor trying to take you over, it, it was very much in your interest to have a strong, thriving economy because a strong, thriving economy meant you had the ability to finance military uh, expenditures and defend yourself. Uh, so whether it was because they were competing just in terms of econ economics, whether it was because they wanted a strong economy so they could fight off their, uh, their enemies, th there was this sort of jurisdictional rivalry in Europe uh, that, that produced good results. And, and uh, I, in the previous slide, I quoted uh, uh, Professor Roland Vobel. He did a presentation at the Mont Pelerin Society, which Doug just mentioned in his remark, a number of years ago, where he looked at all the academic research. You don't need to worry. I mean, if you want to get the presentation, I'm sure it can be made available to you. But I'm simply showing you a slide he had in his presentation looking at all the academic research showing that you had a political fragmentation leading to institutional competition. Uh, there was the ability of capital to exit, labor to exit. There was yardstick competition. Uh, there were all sorts of things that, that created this period of, again, classical liberalism, not modern liberalism, in Europe. And I want to show you in some practical ways what this meant. Nowadays, when you think of a free market economy with small government, we think of Hong Kong and Singapore, because those are the smallest government places in the world right now. And what do we find in places like Singapore and Hong Kong? You find that government consumes, uh, in terms of fiscal policy, consumes about 20% of economic output. In other words, for every $5 the private sector produces, the government diverts $1, or whatever their currencies are. Uh, well, if you go back to the 1800s in Europe, you'll find that the tax burden was less than 10% of GDP. So in other words, we think today of Hong Kong as being hyper-free market and Singapore as being hyper-free market, but governments in those two places twice as big as what it used to be in Europe in the 1800s. And even as you got into the 1900s, you see the, the little upticks, especially with World War I. Of course, governments needed to spend more money then because they were fighting each other. Even, even at the end of World War I, the total tax take was only just approaching what they have in places like Singapore and Hong Kong today. Now, that's the tax side of the fiscal ledger. Uh, let's look at government spending. Well, here's total government spending in six countries in the world. Uh, there's, a, there's the U.S. and Japan, but focus on Sweden, the U.K., Germany, and France. This chart starts in 1870. 
If you look at 1870 and 1913, right at the very uh, eve of World War I, total government spending was only averaging about 10% of GDP. Now, that's like libertarian fantasy world, but that's, actually, that's what you had all through the 1800s and early 1900s uh, in, uh, in Europe, not to mention North America, uh, Japan, and other places that were, were developing. And even if you got all the way to the Great Depression uh, and not all the way to 1960, you know, government was still relatively small, much smaller than it is in the United States today and Western Europe today. Uh, so government was very, very small, especially in the 1800s and early 1900s. And if you look specifically at the welfare state spending, well, here's social spending as a share of GDP. This is from the Our World and Data website. And you can see there was basically zero welfare state. Almost no redistribution, no social insurance, uh, all the way up to 1900. Then you see a few countries uh, beginning in 1900, and, a pro and even in 1930, it was like the, the biggest welfare state in Europe in 1930 was 5% of GDP in Germany. And in most other countries, it was 3% of GDP or less. Now, just to give you some context, social welfare spending in Hong Kong is about 3% of GDP. So most European countries, just 100 years ago, had a smaller welfare state than what you have in Hong Kong today. Now, why is this important? Because Europe became a rich continent when government was very, very small. This is a chart from our world and data from 1820 to 2016. And you can see that it was during that period, and if I did a logarithmic chart, uh, you know, it, it would flatten out some, but it would, it would show the same basic story. You would see that, that economic growth took off. In 1800, the entire world, all of Europe included, was basically mired in agricultural poverty. By the time you got to like 1900, early 1900s, uh, they were like three, four, five, six times as rich. The Industrial Revolution, during this period of laissez-faire and small government, made Europe extremely rich. Now, they didn't all become rich at the same rate. Some, were, had, some of them had more trouble with wars. Some of them had more trouble with domestic turmoil. Uh, some of them were better at producing and promoting the rule of law, uh, which is a key building block to enabling prosperity to happen. Uh, but you can see that you had this incredible explosion of wealth uh, in the Western world when government was very, very small.